Welcome back to the Tasting Room, episode four. We are Man, four episodes old. We're already four. Already four. Technically five. We did a zero, but again, it gets confusing. Right. We're four episodes old. Man, it's been uh, already a really fun journey. It already has. a lot of really cool conversations. I'm really looking forward to this conversation yep. with Eric. Uh, I think that he's going to be able to speak into a lot of different history and answer a lot of really cool questions of what has brought him to the point yeah. where he is. And if you couldn't tell by the title of this episode or the drop of the first name, Eric Marshall, founder, probably head brewer still, I would assume. Uh, uh, I'm going to call him Master, Master brewer. brewer. There you go. Or, or Godfather Brewer. Yeah. Or the Godfather, <laughs> although he doesn't wear a pinky ring. No, or, or, or a gold chain necklace. Yeah, I was kind of, kinda, that. you know. We got to work on that look for him. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've got to eventually get him to the Godfather look. <laughs> That's right. We'll do that. But let's just get right into it. It was a great conversation. Um, we had great whiskey, great beer. It was great all the way around. It's a it's a it's a great listen. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think that you're gonna have a lot of fun. I do too. Eric Marshall after the break. Hey, I'm John. I'm one of the partners here at Grassfire Creative. We are a production company. We do animation, video production, live production. Anything you need to creatively tell both your story and your business's story. Along with the content that we create, we also provide the strategy behind how to get it in front of the eyeballs that matter to you. We're located right in the middle of the United States in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so no matter where you are, we're just a short flight away. Bottom line is we are very excited to both meet you and tell your business's story. Please do reach out to us one of the ways below via email or phone number and check out more about us at our website, grassfirecreative.com. Well, welcome back to the tasting room. Uh, I'm really excited for this week, John. Uh, <laughs> no, we're, we're still going. We, All right. You did it on the good. first time. Yeah, you I did. You have do to do a second take. That's Eric, right. You have to do a second take every time, but because you're here, he got you know. the first hit. Well, so we're excited to welcome Eric Marshall of Marshall Brewing Company. The Godfather. Yeah. <laughs> The godfather of the beer. <laughs> Would you like to kiss my rat? There you go. That's was, not my thing. <laughs> the, the, my taproom uh, employees were, were saying, you know, you should ask him, does he wear a pinky ring? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've said something like that before, and i like, nah, no. Yeah. That's, that's not my style. How you been, man? Good. You yeah. know, it's been, uh, it's been a wild ride the last year Boy, and a half yeah. or so, you know? And so it's... Uh, you know, we're back in the fall where, where festivals and everything have happened. So, you know, once again, it's like that feeling of Oktoberfest being done feels so great, which it's been like two years since that feeling. So, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a constant thing every year you hit, hit that. And then it's kind of, you can breathe, you can breathe. And, and, and move forward a little bit. I don't so. think anyone told Oktoberfest about COVID. Yeah. I don't think it existed out <laughs> that there. That was just a party like COVID, like like 2020 just didn't happen yeah. to Oktoberfest. Yeah, you know, it, it was wild because I was uh, constantly like the only person in the tent wearing a mask, which people may think is weird, but, you know, my kids can't get vaccinated yet, but there fortunately go. next week they can. Right awesome. on. Uh, yeah. so, uh, so, you know, you, you do everything. And we unfortunately lost uh, my father-in-law oh, back man. in January from COVID. Yeah. So it's been a very... Uh, Mm. You know, very follow the line for for everything as cautious as possible on that front. So yeah, I respect that though. Mm, yeah, that's the way it should much. be. So you can go ahead and get started. I'm gonna start yeah. pouring. Uh, I went different. So I'd been bringing these like bottle picks from the bourbon group I'm in and all this stuff, and people can't buy them at home. This little thing or big thing, early times is my favorite cheap bourbon. Right on. I'm it's excited. Like Twenty four bucks for this bottle. Right on. Where's it from? Awesome. That's a great question. Kentucky. Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. An- another right another one in that cheap range mm-hmm. is have you tried the uh, the Jim Beam bottled and bond? No, I haven't. Oh, yet. I have. Really good. Really. Okay. Yeah. It's right really good. On it was one of those that somebody brought and kind of surprised me, and it was like, that's yeah, that's Eric. That's were you going to want ice in yours? Uh, sure, I'll take a little ice. Okay. Maybe maybe I'll give a little little go first, and then throw me one ice cube. <laughs> Ooh, almost knocked it over. You pass that down. All right. And then once you get your ice there. Well, I'll start off with uh, my first question. Um, Eric, just 
for for people listening, um, you know your your history with the craft beer industry in Tulsa is really thick. Could you tell us a little bit of how I uh, you know I don't I don't know if I've actually ever asked this of you in person, but tell us a little bit about your history, how you actually got into brewing, and what the scene of Tulsa looked like back then. <laughs> Well, um, so a lot of credit, I guess, uh, just getting into brewing. Um, you know, I, I kind of started like a lot of people did in home brewing, um, but it was through my older brother. Uh, he, when he was in law school, he um, started doing a little home brewing just uh, for like tailgates. He went to OU for, for law school. And um, we both went to TU. He's a little bit older than me, but tailgating wasn't a thing at TU, so he had to learn that. We're trying to, to make it a thing, right? Still, yeah, yes, but it's and, just and, not quite there. And I've been trying yeah, to make it doing, a thing yeah, too yeah, yeah. for so yeah. long. I love the family-friendly atmosphere of it now, and my kids love love that. Mm -hmm. But anyways, um, so he got into it a little bit there, and so you know, it just kind of happened to be one of those things where, <laughs> um, you know, freshman year of college, I was down there at the time, and he's like, "Hey, help me do this," and started to get a little interesting, but then. Um, I went and studied, uh, I'd studied international business in German at TU and, uh, went and studied my junior year of college, uh, in Germany and lived with a family that didn't speak English and really was just immersed in the language and culture and lived right near, uh, one of the large German breweries called Kronbacher, um, there. And, uh, it was the first time basically as part of our program, we had to, we had to do something uh, in this orientation period where our professor from TU came over and, uh, we had to, we had to do something big and write about it. And I was like, well, I, I like beer. I've never toured a brewery. I've done a little brewing. And so, uh, went in, uh, in a very, you know, broken American accent, asked them if I could take a tour. And they were like, uh, yeah, we've got a group coming in. So just come on through. And so I went and it was just super fascinating. And so, uh, I started as, as part of that, do something. You also had to write kind of a paper about it and, and everything. And so I started to research a little bit more into brewing and the history and tradition in Germany and all of that, and just really kind of fell in love with that aspect of it. Obviously also being able to drink fresh local beer, uh, right from the source right there, uh, was also great. And so, mm. you know, when I came back from my, my senior year of college, I was over there for about seven months, traveled extensively drank a lot of good beer and and just uh got back and and you know we had our friends down at chalk uh doing their thing and that was really it uh, for the most part in oklahoma and so just kind of saw a need and an opportunity at that same time my brother had moved back from um from law school and my dad converted my bedroom at our house into a home pub. So thanks, I love dad. that. Right on. Uh, so we convinced dad if he invested some money in a nice homebrew system, then he could serve his own beer at his pub. So we had beer lines running up from the basement. It was really, oh my word. It's really that's, cool. That's, that's very awesome. professional. Um, yeah. yeah, right. And so uh, just got really serious into it and then saw a need and an opportunity and happened to mention to some family friends that... Uh, that uh, was interested in, in brewing as a career. Um, this is, you know, if you want to want to call it a, a sign or a calling or whatever, it was actually at a charity function at, at our church. And uh, they were like, oh, well, our son's best friend is a German brewmaster who lives in Munich. We'll have to get you guys in contact. And it was like, what are the odds hey, of wow, that? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so this guy had come over and lived with their son for a year, and he was the consultant that opened um, – Royal Bavaria, which is a little brew oh, wow. uh, German yeah. restaurant in Moore, Oklahoma. And so um, he had a soft spot in his heart for Oklahoma. So he actually called me the next day and was like, hey, tell me what, what you're wanting to do. Mm -hmm. How can I help? Like, I love these people. I love Oklahoma. Uh, I want to do what I can do. So through him, uh, once I graduated, I went back over uh, to Germany and met up with him and kind of outlined sort of course of study, uh, an apprenticeship. And that was, um, what led me into the the World Brewing Academy, which is the same program Austin ended up doing, uh, but then through independently through him, was able to arrange a bunch of apprenticeships all over Germany. So once I finished, um, once I finished that uh, program, then I went and uh, hooked up with a buddy of his who was a secondhand equipment dealer, and so we did a bunch of small projects together. And he actually ended up being the guy who helped me find find our brew house mm. and uh, do the install and all that stuff. But then 
through a bunch of his contacts and through this other guy, we, I got the opportunity to to go work or, or um, you know, at least shadow in six or seven different breweries throughout Germany. And so for me, it was an excuse to go back to Germany and have some fun. Yep, yep. But also, you know, an opportunity to, uh, to, to learn, you know, from a tradition that's obviously very well known for, uh, for brewing. And so uh, it was a great opportunity, had a great time. Uh, but then once I moved back, I also knew um, that I wanted to get some experience in the craft side of things. So uh, got back uh, in, I think it was no, that would have been November of 2005. I think that's right. And um, just threw a resume out to a few different places uh, and then literally got a call that afternoon from Victory mm. up in Pennsylvania, uh, did a phone interview the next day. Uh, got offered a job the day after that and said, well, like if I'm moving halfway across the country, like I want to at least come check the place out and all that. Went out there, fell in love with it. Great opportunity from two guys who, who took a similar route, went to Germany uh, and and studied over there. And um, it just, uh, it was a great opportunity to really go to a brewery um, that was making great beer, obviously rooted in sort of that German tradition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and also be at an opportunity where they're going through a rapid amount of growth and, and learning how, you know, you balance, uh, quality and, and making sure the product's right as you go through those growth measures and everything. So it was a great mm. opportunity and, um, still have very fond memories of, of my time there and, uh, still am upset that we don't get uh, victory in Oklahoma because yeah. I'd love to be able to continually buy some some prima pills but you know despite my cries for that to, <laughs> to, to ron yeah. and bill haven't uh, haven't seen that yet so we had some in arkansas for a little while so we got to when we were distributing over in little rock we got to do a kind of a, a co-event with mm. them when they launched that's um, cool because i got them hooked up with our distributor over there which was which was really cool and so um you know i'm still in contact with a few of those those folks um but most of the guys that I work with have, have now gone on to do other things as well. And so, um, I know that sound. Yeah. That's a fantasy football. <laughs> oh, I, don't a fantasy know, I don't football know what it is. It's, uh, <laughs> yep. Dak Prescott was upgraded. To there actor, we go. So, hey, um, Matt, now I get the choice of, do I start him or do I stick with Matt Stafford? I think I'm sticking with Stafford. Ooh, that's a week. tough one. You got two. Don't that is a tough one. I've, I've, I've had, I've had Dak Prescott go on, you know, up until, uh, last week when he was out and he is, He's edged out Stafford every week, but uh, yeah, you want to stick with Stafford. Okay. We'll right. we'll now Michael we'll Gallup is coming back for the Cowboys sometimes. <laughs> he soon. is. Yes, that's yeah. true. That's true. Um, but yeah, so so once I once I uh, my my kind of original plan was to spend some time doing that, but then I also really wanted to uh, get some experience in a in a brew pub, just as a smaller setting. Um, but uh, you, you talked about Elliot being on the show. Um, Elliot and I became, um, friends basically like right when he opened McNally's was right as I was finishing up at TU. And so my, uh, my dad who, um, you know, is the classic, Hey, let me tell you about what my son's getting ready to do and, yeah. and doting on me, which love, thank you, you know, but I'm, I'm also the kind of person that, you know, you I, love that. I, yeah. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but that was a great opportunity because then Elliot kind of took an interest in that because he had said, hey, you know, kind of the whole, you know, Frank Zappa is like every every great place needs their own beer and and uh, and mm -hmm. whatever. I can't remember the, the full quote, but uh, but so um, I went back with some buddies later on that evening and we just struck up this conversation and just built a really solid friendship. And so we remained in contact you know, the whole time I was doing this and, and by his encouragement, basically he said, you know, I, the time's right. You need to come back. Mm. You need to get this going. I'll get you introduced to, you know, the right people to help, help with the, with the, the, the investing side to help with uh, the wholesale, you know, everything. And um, so it was really his persuasion to get this going that, that, that uh, encouraged me to get back and do it at that point. So it was Probably the worst time in craft beer history to start a brewery because right as we were getting going, um, we hit a 
you know, this huge hop crisis uh, where one of the oh, one right. of the big suppliers like but burned the, to the ground. This was 2008. Two, eight. Yeah. Uh, we had horrible crop years for barley. So prices, prices and hops basically went from like an average of like three to five dollars a pound to upwards of like forty dollars a pound. Good. Uh, really averaging at that time around twenty dollars. And so. I guess and just high, to kind of give a point of reference, what are they now? Um, twenty dollars is on the very high end right, right. now. I would yep. say twenty to twenty-two dollars is some of those like, you know, hard to find, hard to get your hands on type of stuff. But I would say ten to fifteen yep. is probably more of the average. You can find some a little lower, yeah, and some a little higher. But um, but yeah, so um. But that was kind of balanced with, um, you know, the timing being right here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always like to say things start on the coast and work their way to Oklahoma. And that was very true with with craft beer as well. But in hindsight, uh, being able to kind of build our pricing at those higher numbers was was a positive for us because uh, we didn't have to change price. We didn't change prices until I think we changed prices for the first time on our, our stuff like a couple of years ago. Huh? And that was the persuasion oh, of, yeah. you know, everything else going in the market. And so, um, so that benefited us to keep things consistent and be able to play, uh, yeah. play ball, you know, at some of these levels. And so, yeah. So when we started, um, we were blazing our own trail and, um, you know, that was, that was, um, that was relevant in, you know, trying to convince people that, hey, yeah, there's a local brewery here in Tulsa doing this thing, so trying to say, hey, we're not making 3-2 beer. And, <laughs> you know, oh, by the way, health department, like I know you have these great uh, uh, restrictions in place to basically, you know, keep, con- keep the consumer safe. But there's also some of this stuff that like is not super applicable, applicable to a brewery. So we had to kind of educate on that mm. front. And and honestly, there were some things that we ended up having to do that I continued to fight for six or seven years to to get some leniency on some other things mm-hmm. for, you know, for future people starting up. Um, but then also, you know, just navigating some of the stuff with the city and, and licensing and, um, you know, that's all before even getting into all the, the you know, legislative change stuff. And so it was uh, it was definitely a. It was definitely, you know, blazing, blazing a trail in a yeah. lot of ways. Um, there's, uh, I'm, I'm sure I had a, just this beautiful, gorgeous head of hair at that point. That's also a lot, but I don't have much I've more seen hair. Pictures. Right? Yeah, it's right. Not, it's it, not true. It's not true. Uh, but you know, definitely I always like to joke that, yeah, I probably lost a couple of years off my life and definitely whatever hair I had left yeah. at that point. But, uh, but you know, uh, at the end of the day, the timing was right. We got to be on the forefront of um, kind of the educational side of craft beer here uh, in Tulsa. So obviously a lot of credit goes to to Elliot, to, to guys like Elliot, to, to, you know, even before him, Jeff Castleberry at Kaz's, who was bringing in, you know, some of this stuff uh, that we got to kind of be on the front end of saying, hey, this is, this is what we mean by creating a culture of craft mm-hmm. beer. This is what a local brewery does. And this is what, uh, uh, so, so a lot of that stuff, um, I'm really grateful that we got to be on the front end of that because, you know, the reason that we started the brewery wasn't from, Uh, the standpoint of like, you know, drink a lot of beer all the time. You know, it was, it was really, really was cultural. And, you know, I love your all's slogan, the crafted for community, because it very much is about that. And, um, you know, for us, it's always been, we want to be a positive, we want to make a positive impact in the community. We want to be good partners uh, in the community because the people who support us are the people in this community. And if we don't, if we don't support back, then, mm-hmm. you know, what, what good are we doing here? And so, you know, um, that, that's always been, been a staple for us. And so to be able to kind of be on the front end and also, you know, honestly, to, to, to weather some of the burden so that we can make it easier to, for others so that we can continue to build the culture, uh, was, was also very important. For mm. us too. Well, I like to ask <clears throat> about fear a lot, apparently, because I, yeah. Uh, we're all entrepreneurs here in different levels. And so I'm curious when, you know, you have Elliot championing, championing, ing, championing. That's yeah, a hard I'm word sure, to say, whatever. but you did it. You have Elliot <laughs> behind you, right? Pushing you, telling you now's the time he can get you, you know, involved with the right people. But like you said, you were blazing your own trail. It hadn't been done here. So what was, if you can remember back to your <laughs> mindset at that point, 
what He's was not the, that old. Well, but I mean, you've slept a few times and had a few beers since then. But do you remember what the level of fear, anxiety, whatever it was about opening the first real brewery in the Tulsa area? Like, was there a, God, this might not work because it's not here. Yeah. I mean, so here's, so my mom, uh, I've, there's entrepreneurial spirit in, in my family. So my mom started when I was a kid making like hair bows and headbands out of, uh, out of a a room in our house, expanded to the garage. Then, uh, you know, fast forward now 35 years or something like that. She's, she has the largest children's clothing store in the Midwest. So that's awesome. I grew up kind of in that environment, seeing what it takes. And which helps. I often joke that my mom and my family is the only one that really understands, you know, all the ins and outs, but you know, I was fortunate too, that, um, that, you know, my brother and I have such a great relationship and, and, you know, honestly, he's probably at the end of the day, my, my biggest cheerleader. And also I think a lot of people can say that, Hey, my brother's my hero, but, but he is in a lot of regards. And, and, you know, I, there's comfort in knowing that he's always had my back Mm -hmm. and always, you know, from the, the, the legal side of things and knowing what we can and can't do and all the research and everything that, that he put into that front, Mm -hmm. um, the support, honestly, that we got from, from Joe Pritchard and Mike Lolly down at Chalk too, and in helping to, because they wanted to see that side of things yeah. grow. Um, there was a lot of comfort there, um, but yeah, I mean, when when we started like raising money to uh, start this brewery, and and I'm going to ask family and friends yeah. and like my friends' parents, it's a harrowing experience to uh, yeah. to to invest <laughs> money in in me uh, more than this actual concept. Yeah, man, that was pretty scary because I, because at yeah. the end of the day, it's like, okay, if this doesn't work out, I still have to face you the rest right. of my life. Like it's a pressure that people that haven't done that just can't comprehend. Yeah. And, and, and I it will. It keeps me up at night. <laughs> sure. It's unreal. I, yeah. I will yeah. say, I mean, let's see, I started when I was 27, when I started the brewery when I was 26, 27. And so. Part of me, it was probably, I, I probably hadn't lived enough life to realize how stupid I was at right, that point. Right. So, you know, there's a level of that, but, but at the same time, that's also the positive. And so I will say that, um, uh, you know, growing up, I've always been pretty laid back, pretty even keeled. I am a way more of an anxious person now than, than I was pre, <laughs> pre all of that stuff. And, uh, and you know, I used to always give my you brother shit pretty because well. he's a pretty anxious, anxious yeah. by yeah. nature. Uh, and now I feel like sometimes I rival him, uh, in that, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a level that people just don't understand. I think people end up at the end of the day, they see, Oh man, we see your beer at quick trip and Reesers and on tap and man, you think that'd be growing great. Well, yeah, I mean, we've got good distribution. We've been able to, to create some great relationships to keep the beer flowing. But at the end of the day, like we are in a manufacturing operation, this is volume. Yeah. And at the end of the day, our volume isn't like a lot of the other people. So there's still a lot of, uh, a lot yeah. of uh, challenges that people don't understand uh, to that level. And, you know, you're constantly managing different, different things. You're managing people, you're managing finances, you're managing investors, you're managing customers, you're managing wholesalers. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, there's there's a lot of different moving parts that that certainly fear fear is a good yeah a, a good word there and you know our thing has always been and I'm fortunate that that my guys understand this and and Wes who's you know our director of sales I love Wes and, to death he's one I of mean, my favorite humans Wes 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 oh, gets it too yeah, yeah. I, I'm with you and Wes gets it too and we very much um, you know he's he's had my back on a lot of things most things I always have his back but it's we do we're we're in a lockstep on a lot of you know, how from, from the ground up, you know, we built the thing is, is relationship based. And, and, you know, I think that helps to kind of suppress some of those fears a little mm-hmm. bit when you have these relationships and you understand that the people that you're dealing with have that faith and trust in you, that helps to kind of calm, it brings a level of fear, but it also yeah, helps to calm, yeah. calm those things at the same time too. Yeah. And, you know, the relationships too, that we've built over the years to be able to you know, not have the fear, not be afraid to ask for help, to ask advice, mm. uh, and so on, which is, you know, at, at the early stages, you know, there is a little bit of pride on that side of things, but as you start to grow and learn that, man, 
Uh, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. that's important. Uh, that's an important thing to learn. To well, learn and, for sure. and I can attest to how open Eric is uh, to that. And I want to thank you for that because uh, being open and really being, he was in the very beginning when, and still to this day, uh, whenever I have a question or don't know the answer, usually you're the first person I go to. And in, very, in the very beginning when I, we hadn't opened up our brewery, you were a wealth of knowledge and basically my sole mentor mm. in the industry. And I don't know if I would have been able to be what we are now without your help and without your guidance. So really is a godfather. Well, yeah, he is. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I, I really appreciate you saying that. I mean, I, th- I think that that's one thing that's important to me and important. And that's kind of a great segue. A couple yeah, of beers you asked to bring. Let's get into, uh, no, <laughs> when you all asked, you were like, hey, you know, bring, bring maybe a beer that's inspiration and then something else. And so the first thing that popped in my head and, and is a great point to that uh, was just something. Sierra Nevada is one of those Man. breweries to me that's just, I think now as the industry's grown and it's become much more hyper local that um, Sierra Nevada gets overlooked oftentimes. It's still, and sometimes it's gets still, a bad rap. It's, sometimes it gets a bad rap, but, but I will say that, that yeah. one thing that kind of speaking to that point and why I jokingly said, Oh, what a great segue um, is, you know, if we can emulate some of the stuff that Sierra's done, and and one thing I always like to point, and and it's and it's very much a highlight of how the industry is, is you know Ken Grossman who who started Sierra Nevada uh, has built it to what it is. They have way more money now to play with in terms of research and development, in terms of uh, you know things that they could use as a competitive advantage to really just crush a lot of us. They have done the opposite and have shared everything that they've done. They they go That's and so spend cool. money and they share everything that they've done to be able to um, to make the craft beer culture better because mm. they understand from a bigger picture. You know, yes, at the end of the day, our pie is one is is a certain size, and everybody's piece is what it is. Yeah. And you know, at the end of the day, business you want that pie obviously to be right. a little bit bigger. They also understand the bigger that we can make the pie, the better it is. The bigger the piece. Right. Yeah. yeah. And 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 I very much love that. And I think that you'll see that uh just across the board in, in craft beer. And so when we started, I knew that, hey, blazing the trail, like, did I do everything right? Nope. Uh is there a way that by me sharing what I did wrong will save somebody a lot of heartache and time yeah. and money? Certainly did for me. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh does at the end of the day, does that make uh, does that make the whole environment better? Yes, it does. Yeah. And in turn makes it better for all of us, right? It's better for the drinker. It's better for, yeah. uh, you know, the camaraderie within the industry. And that's one thing that I, I really love that's been able to develop. Um, you come over to our block on, you know, most Thursday or whatever, yeah. you'll, you'll yeah. see, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll come out of the office with my little nerd hole that I hide in all the time now. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't get to do the fun stuff that I started the brewery. Right, to do. Now I right. get to deal with all the stuff nobody wants to deal with. But all, all around the corner and sitting on the dock will be some of, some of these guys, along with some of the Solera folks, mm-hmm. and, you know, maybe Glenn from Renaissance or, or Jake or one of those guys from, from, from Heirloom. And, and I just love that. I love the fact that we are where we are. And, and you know, if I had, if you had come to me and I was like, no, I'm not going to tell you, you know, whatever, like, I doubt we'd be neighbors. You know, well, yeah, maybe we wouldn't be neighbors, but at the same time, like, you know, maybe something would have happened and, and you would have gone a different route. And it just, you know, there's a lot of things that I like to say. It's like the more that we can work together to, to create this culture here locally, the better. Um, you know, when we started, there was so much, there was so much of like a microscope on us because you know, you're making alcohol in Oklahoma. That's, mm-hmm. you're, you're kind of the devil. You're, you're kind of the devil at that yeah, point, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, you know, we don't want, you know, by people not understanding how things worked, at least getting to that point where we were, if we regress in that regard, that puts the microscope even tighter on everybody yeah. else. And so the more that we can up the game and continue to, you know, help each other collaboratively, the better it is. And that paid forward too in, in the legislative side. Of yeah, so all that thing started was, 
you know, we wanted to be able to offer tours and samples because when we started, we technically couldn't even sample our own product out of the tank, right? Mm. Um, so it That's started fine. as a as a change to um, be able to just offer somebody a sample when they walked in the door. Again, part of the education piece. Uh, after a three year fight, we got that change, but then it turned into a bigger, bigger, bigger thing as all the other pieces started to realize: okay, we can we can modernize the laws here and look at what the craft brewers mm-hmm. did with the, the sampling thing. And so that, as that kind of took shape, realized real quick that a, I don't have the time to live at the Capitol again, like I did for the sampling deal and B um, you know, my brother is a practicing lawyer and I don't have the money to pay him to, uh, yeah. <laughs> to deal with this all the time. So we, we were able to kind of organize a bunch of the other breweries um, to, to get this thing going. And, and it, I mean, it's, had a drastic impact on, on the industry mm. and, um, and, and, you know, and, and the culture, I mean, because again, we couldn't, we couldn't have tap rooms or the tap yeah. rooms. Once, once a loophole was found where we could have three, two tap rooms, that still just wasn't really it, you right. know? Uh, and so now we have this great, uh, great atmosphere, great culture, great scene with all these, uh, these great breweries. Uh, it's a great time to be, a a beer drinker in Oklahoma, and um, we'll pass good. one of those awesome. down here. Yeah, yeah for sure. So we're we're yeah. Mm. Eric, what what is this beer? This is a Sierra Nevada Celebration, which is their fresh hop IPA, and this was kind of one of those things. Mm. Um, you cheers, know, boys! Yeah, cheers. cheers. I uh, was sitting there. I had to run by the grocery store last night, and I saw it, and I was like, "Man, I haven't seen this in a long time," and it's just mm, such beer. a great beer. Um, between i think pale mm. ale is the best beer they make period but i think no, I, I think I would agree. this is my favorite beer yep. if there I, can be the difference I, I think you can make an argument for any one of their yeah. beers i yeah. mean i was sitting there talking about uh bigfoot the other day another and, great beer and yeah. you know some 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 crazy things that i've done after drinking <laughs> some bigfoot you know did you uh, especially care in, to uh, spe- tell us especially in college <laughs> but um <laughs> If but, he remembers, but, no uh, one's listening. You can tell but, us. But yeah, no, I've told the story too many times. But um, but I've got you know several vintages still of, of that, and it's just like God, it's such a great beer. Uh, but then you can make a, obviously, pale ale is the the gold standard. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but this torpedo. I mean, you just go down the They're list. So good, like yeah. everything they 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 make is is great and still family owned and operated. Again, great people. Yeah, no, I love it's yeah. NPR. You hear those commercials it's like still family owned, operated, and argued, argued over, over. And it's like yeah. God, that is so true. Yeah. <laughs> Can't tell you how true. many knockdown fights I've gotten in with uh, with family over mm, man. over stuff. And but, this is a seasonal. It's only winter, right? It is. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's their their fresh hop ale. So it just ends up being. Uh, you know, when they can harvest, uh, harvest the, the, the fresh hop, the wet hop, they can throw it in and get it out just yeah. in time for the, the holiday. You know what I love about that is I think in most people's mind, if you try to make a seasonal calendar of what kind of beers are released when, this time of year starts, you know, you leave the Oktoberfest and the Marzins and the Dunkles behind and you start going towards the Stouts and all the heavy beers. Yeah. And yet here they come with a fresh hop IPA. Yep. And I'm like, thank you. Like, that's fantastic. Yeah. It's still a great time to drink an IPA. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, is, is there, there a, ever a bad time to drink an IPA? True. No, there's this really not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's fantastic. Well, yeah. Uh, going back to what you were saying about... Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. I was just going to put it down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My seat's a little lowered this week or something. I thought you were getting too, yeah. too big of a head, so I had no, to lower oh, you down okay. a little bit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. Uh, but yeah, like... In a, a great example of what you were saying with Sierra Nevada being open and really developing, um, do you, the our little corner of the the brewery community, um, especially with with what you've you've done for us and whatnot. I just want everybody to know, like you've you've brewed my beer <laughs> when I was one in one of my most crucial moments in life. And you didn't have to do that. You brewed twice. You transferred a couple of times and kegged my beer when I couldn't. And that, I will never forget that. And that, that's just something mm. that's uh, not every industry players or no, business You don't owners. help each other like that. No, in all no, no, no. Yeah. And you should. Like, humans right. should do that. There's some but, things but, that, are, that are bigger than, than that, you know. And mm-hmm. at, the, at the end of the day... 
we're people and, um, you know, we're part of the same industry. Uh, you know, there's a lot of love in this community and in, you know, our specific community too. And, you know, you just, you hit a point where things just, some of those things just don't matter. And at the end of the day, there's a, there's a humanity side of it. And, you know, when, when you're in a position where, uh, you know, you have a specific knowledge or skill set that at that moment in time can be offered to alleviate some stress or anxiety or whatever, you know, I, I'm just so fortunate that I was in that position to be able to, to help at that time because, um, you know, no, nobody, nobody needs to, at that moment of darkness, nobody needs to, to worry about how to press on and, right. and, and things that at that moment in time don't mean anything. Right. You know? Well, I'm very so. appreciative of that. But, um, so, uh, I really want to know you've been, you've been in business at your brewery for what? Thir- Thir- 12, 13, 13 years now and a half years. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, that's really, really cool. Yeah. Congrats. yeah Thank you. Um, and you've seen Tulsa really grow. You've you've seen the McNelly's group grow and the all of the restaurant and scene of our culture really expand and become a really cool spot in in the Midwest and in the middle of of, of our country. Um, what I, I really want to know what what is your most I don't want to call it prideful moment, but what 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 is the what is the thing within the last thirteen years that you can pinpoint and go, dang, that was awesome. Man, that's uh, ooh, that's kind of loaded. That's heavy. That's man. a big one. Yeah. That's a whale of a question. There, getting some tears going. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, there's a lot of things. Sometimes I, th- I sometimes think sometimes I can be light, yeah, and sometimes yeah. I can you be know, heavy. I, th- I think one thing that that was um, that was really uh, cool that just kind of came out of nowhere was we got an award from the uh the department of labor a few years ago for essentially like creating an industry that is a is a huge tax uh a tax revenue generator mm. and to kind of have that uh you know recognition i guess it's not something that 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 um, it's not something that we necessarily like, I mean, you don't go out and seek that, but to just get a call out of nowhere yeah. and say, Hey, You're not submitting like, resumes to the department of labor because, right? because yeah. of the state be, from the standpoint of when we started the challenges that we faced just from the exterior of, you know, of Oklahoma and being, you know, very buckle of the Bible belt conservative, like you don't, you don't drink alcohol here, you know, let alone you don't make alcohol to then have, you know, politicians basically saying thank you for the role that you've played in creating this was, was a huge, uh, was a huge deal. And I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, that was a culmination of also the whole modernization of alcohol laws that, Mm -hmm. that caused the industry to expand more and, you know, everything there. So kind of as you start to look back on some of those things, it's not necessarily individual to the brewery. It's on the whole. And because at the end of the day, it, again, it's, it's, how are we making this community better? How are we, you know, getting to this point? And, you know, like I said, we've always had a focus. We've always wanted to be able to use the brewery to do great things in the community. I know you guys do Solera, you know, all these breweries do. Yep. And the more that we are, we're doing this, even individually, it makes such a huge impact in this community. Mm-hmm. And I think when you start doing something like this, people, people just think the negative immediately and don't realize how much positive comes from this mm-hmm. and how much positive there is uh, in that side of things. And, and so, you know, I mean, to, to be able to do that and, and now to have a platform, uh, you know, like you said, this, this Sunday I'm working the tap room because my daughter's teacher is stuck in Spain right now. That's a and, crazy story. Right. That's and wild. and so now I'm now I'm kind of becoming a fake ass like immigration attorney too without going <laughs> to law school. Um but it, but at the end of the day it's like, you know, these are great people who have come to live in Tulsa that are now that have now run into a mm-hmm. situation but 
you know, I'm able to use that position to help out in some way to alleviate some anxiety or whatever, but also have a little fun doing yeah, it absolutely. too, right? And and what you said before is the fun part. You don't get to do that much anymore. It, exactly, right? Right? exactly. Yeah. But you know, it's it's those kind of things that you know. Now that we've progressed to this point, we're able to do that. You guys are able to do that. Solera, that that uh, nothing's left. That all these guys, and so you know, that's great. Another thing I will say too is when we had that fire back in February. I was going to ask about... To, to yeah. be the recipient of the love from, from all of you guys was, mm-hmm. I mean, like I, I'm tearing up just thinking about that because it's just like, you know, in again, sort of you hit a dark hour and then all of a sudden, you know, everybody, come, everybody in your circle have comes your yeah. to say, yeah. you know, man, we're feeling this with you. And, you know, you guys and Solera both offered, hey, you, you want to... Use our tap room as a pop up if if we get to that point, and you know nothing's left. Send a bunch of pizzas to the the local fire station. That's awesome. That night. I mean that that straight up made me cry. You know, our bar, Josh Royal did the you whole. You know, our bar and Josh, night. yeah, yeah. And, and so it's yeah. just, you just start to feel, um, feel to be the recipient. You you don't want to be in that position, right. but then to feel the recipient of that love, uh, was was probably one of the single like yeah. greatest things that that feelings that i've had yeah. overall and so take me back to that morning <laughs> so like it's a snowy ass day it yeah. was cold it cold the, as hell the kids cold. are home from school because a quarantine and b they wouldn't have been in school yeah. anyways right. because it was two degrees and there was you know that much ice on the streets so um so i actually went into the we had kind of you know we were kind of at, at that time of year production is what it is you're just trying to like maintain but also like get ready for spring and summer. When was it February? Here we go. February February. 16th. So, um, because it was so cold, we have a, um, our water filtration system after so many gallons through the thing back flushes to basically clear out the, uh, the media that's in there. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, to extend the life of that. So at one point during the day, the day before that thing back flushed and, the water froze in the pipes. And so I stopped by at some point that morning just to check on everything. Cause I told the guys like, Hey, like nobody needs to get out. We're, we're fine on production. Like just stay home. Um, enjoy a, enjoy a snow day. Right. Like, like you're a kid in school. Right. So, um, so I show up and then the pipes frozen. So there's water everywhere on mm. the inside because of that. And so I'm back and forth between home Depot, getting a couple of parts so that I can, you know, do some plumbing and figure this whole yeah. problem out, uh, get that all figured out. Uh, one of our guys, Tim, uh, who's a, who was an off duty fireman. Uh, he was there doing, he was like, man, I just had to get out of the house. Sorry if his wife's listening. <laughs> um, uh, but he was there doing just some preventative maintenance stuff. Mm-hmm. And he was like, man, I just had a couple things I wanted to get done, uh, whatever. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to run next door, check on things. Uh, and then I'm heading out. So, uh, appreciate whatever. So, uh, I run into the, the old man next door who, who owns the building and he was like, Hey, I I hope you don't mind. Um, I'm going to park here for a little bit. I'm dealing with some frozen pipes and I'm like, Hey, we, we just made the call that, you know, the parking lot's pure ice. Like we're not going to be open today. It was, it was a Tuesday. I think we're not going to be open today. So no big deal. Uh, good luck with that. So then I go to, um, I was at the grocery store, um, because my, my, my father-in-law had just passed from COVID and I didn't want my mother-in-law trying to get out. So, um, I was getting some stuff for her and I get a phone call from Matt Denham, uh, down at Solera. Yeah. And he was like, Hey, uh, are you at the brewery? The, the fire department's trying to get in your building. Uh, the, the building next door is on fire. And I'm like, no, no, but, uh, Tim was there just a minute ago when I left. So this was like 30 minutes after I left. So this is like one thirty or something like that. So I called Tim and Tim's like, oh man, he was like, that's crazy. I just had two calls from different firefighter buddies that, that, you know, I missed. So I'll run over there real quick. And it's funny cause you can pull up the cameras and see like when Tim runs over oh, there, really? unlocks the door and you just see the smoke oh. escape once oh, those, once the, once those windows from the new tap room, from the new tap room. Yeah. And so, uh, so I, I basically, I'm standing, I, it's like, there's nothing I can do at this point. Yeah. So like, I'm going to go ahead and just finish checking out here. Right. And, and, uh, but your mind is just my not like, there. Oh, yeah. In fact, my, my wife, uh, when I called her and told her she, uh, she dropped a, um, 
a pretty heavy curse word, which is very untypical of her. <laughs> right. And my kids to this day still, mommy, you remember that one time you said this word? And she's like, yes, I do, I do remember. So it was first, justified. First off, you know, yeah. at that point you're five and eight. Why do you even know what those words are? But right. You know, right. That's another story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, so, you know, so then I get there and thank God for Tim. Like he's, Tim's one of the best people I know. Uh, I think, you know, people that know him in the industry know just how awesome Tim is. But Tim's also a pretty soft-spoken guy and, and, and everything. But um, he immediately, you know, jumps into to action, grabs a walkie-talkie so we know what's going on the whole time. Chief Baker from the fire department was so cool and so on top of it and was, was, uh, was filling me in on everything as we're going. And so, I mean, at this point, you just kind of, you just kind of got to watch, right? And uh, things That's just started to such do, a weird things feeling. Things started to progressively yeah. get worse. And Tim was kind of like, hey, you're like, this is, I don't understand what's going on, why they're going defensive. And what had happened was there was like four levels of roof and it was so cold that it just, the fire just kept going and the roof started to collapse. But their saws were freezing up, so they couldn't even cut through the roof. And so they oh, just wow. hit a point where... They realized what the situation was, and they just moved to, to going defensive and protecting our building. And uh, so you just kind of got to sit there and watch and, like, hope. And, you know, we're, we're, we're trying Man. to do what we can do. I remember, you know, some of the news stations uh, were there, and, and I just remember being like, oh, oh you want to do an interview? And I remember at one <laughs> point I did an interview with, with somebody, and fortunately this one didn't air, but I just remember at one point, like, just, you know, your train of thoughts just flowing, right? Because I'm sitting there with the anxiety of watching a building that I own potentially burn to the ground. That's you know, yeah, that's you know, accounts for a third of our overall revenue of everything. Uh, and I, I just looked. I was like, I, I mean, at this point, I, I what do you say? Uh, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, that one didn't air, but uh, it, was, it was funny. One of my good friends is yeah. uh, he's in the music business and in Nashville and, and made a pretty name, pretty big name for himself. And I, I think I texted him after that. I was like, Hey, if this interview airs, will you just forward this to Carrie yeah, Underwood? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, fortunately that, that didn't, but it was just funny thinking back on that, but it's just, you know, the anxiety of everything. And I think I remember like, you know, at one point, like Katie who manages the tap room at Solera at one point, like, I think she was like in tears. And I think that was kind of the first part of like, you start to feel the love that, that, yeah. you know, all the guys around are like, Hey man, we're, we got your back. We're here for you and whatever we can do. And so, you know, again, it's one of those things that you kind of, you, 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 a tragedy, then the silver lining of that just realizes how great the friendships and the camaraderie yeah. and, and, and everything are uh, in this industry, in this community and, and the amount of love from, you know, people that I didn't even know had my phone number. Uh, that we that I received that night was 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 really amazing, and so you know it's not something I ever wish anybody to go through. We were down tap room for four and a half months, and fortunately didn't take any fire damage, but a ton of smoke damage and water damage, and and uh, you know some physical damage where they mm -hmm. had to bust through the the wall and everything. But you know later that night, uh, as I've sat there for you know six hours watching these people put their lives on the line and you know honestly at the end of the day to watch the firemen work like it was it was an honor you know right to, to see firsthand you know how the training and protocols and everything that they do uh was incredible but at the end of the night you know one of those firemen told me just apologizing to me saying man i'm sorry we couldn't do more and i'm just like really whoa like yeah. you legitimately saved my building you legitimately saved the business and you're apologizing to me um, so, you know, it was a humbling moment on that, that front. And so, you know, just chalk it up to another, yeah. another, another notch in the belt of the 2020s, man. I mean, the, just, the craziest thing I remember man. seeing someone posted a picture, I think it was on Facebook. It was so cold that when the firefighters would like, they would go in shifts, they would get out of their waiter type things and they would be frozen solid oh, yeah. and standing straight up. Yep. I'm like, Holy yeah, man, and the, the water, I don't know if you know this, but the water that was coming off of their hoses was creating basically a river into yeah. our into, parking lot. Into Solera. And, and yeah. Into yeah. Solera. Yeah. But watching them do what they were doing, 
they were walking through that river, which was at least yeah. 12, nope. 16 inches deep at one point in time. It, and they're just trudging through it like it's nothing. 12 degrees outside and they're yeah, shooting it was, water. It was crazy. Everywhere. One of the guys that I knew that was standing on top of the running, the one in the water cannon, like on top of the truck, right in front of that building. You know, he jumps down and he was literally like an ice, like a human icicle. Mm. And I was just <laughs> like, good God, man. Like, I hope, I hope you're okay. Yeah. After all of yeah. This. But yeah, like it was crazy because Tulsa transit brought a bus in so that they could rotate people in to, to keep them. The community warm. just responded. That's, it yeah. was, it was, it was pretty amazing, but, uh, you know, not something I ever, ever want to go through again, but yeah. could have been much worse and, and nobody got hurt. Was the first beer That's you made awesome. after that a smoky beer? Um, no, but. Because <laughs> uh, that would have been ironic and funny. No, but um, you you uh, you better believe that February 16th from now on will be some sort of smoke beer Smoke release. beer. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I don't know. Moving moving forward, yeah. forward, yeah. I don't know if you noticed this, uh, but Lisa was like, I, I don't know how to not advertise because our Mrs. Stoutfire day is like two, it was two How days ironic. after yeah. that. And she's taking a photo. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. 48 hours later. And she's like, I don't know if I should do this or post it. Cause she's got like little flames behind a bottle and glass. And <laughs> it was, that, that, that's funny. I didn't know that. I definitely like that night. That went um, through her brain. She was like, I don't know if I should advertise this That's today. Funny. That night, I definitely like made a social media post. I think I had drank a guy macho or something like that after, after, and I was like, "Well, I said on the bright side, this beer is straight fire or whatever." <laughs> and so I think I, I think I got a bunch of like, "Oh, thank God, we've been so worried about you yeah, or whatever," you know, text with that. Yeah, but yeah. It was just like, hey, you, you know, you just gotta. At some point, you just yeah, got to open yours. It, right? What's in this silver can? Okay. So, not Coors Light. Yeah. Mo- moving on just a little bit. No, this is not Coors Light. This is anything but light. Oh, uh, okay. So this is our, this is our uh, fourth anniversary ale. Oh, nice. Yeah. So this is, this is fun for me. I, I actually haven't had a glass of this. Mm-hmm. So I've had it out of the tank. In a silver can? Yeah. It's a, it hasn't even been labeled yet. Uh, so it is a golden strong, uh, and and I got to go to a PTA meeting after this. You're you'll be, be the wife you'll of be that party. <laughs> it is at the brewery. You'll be so. up. There you go. Yeah, uh, that's one benefit of of uh, you know COVID protocol not being able to get into the yeah. school for PTA meetings is. <laughs> there beer, you go. beer garden's a great place for PTA meetings. But anyway. cheers, yeah, cheers, cheers guys. I'll ask uh, my next question, and then we'll move on to yours. Right. Um, and I'll tell you this, Eric, the thing I, and actually both of your breweries do this, and I respect it and I love it about both of them, is that there was this moment in time, and I don't know if we've left it yet, where I felt like the game in the craft beer industry was how many adjuncts can we put in a beer, <laughs> right? And we might still be there for some breweries. I'm not going to name any, but like there's, sure. there's a lot of people that do a lot of weird shit when it comes to their beer. And that's okay. But it, it, it is 100% sure. okay. But both of you, I can come to your brewery and... You make beer and you make good beer and you don't worry about like you might age something in a barrel or you might put a thing or two in something, but I can get a lager. I can get a Pilsner. I can get an IPA. I can get, you know, seasonal, a stout or a Marzen or whatever it is. Right. And yours, a lot of Belgians and stuff like that. Was that done on purpose? For you, like, was that yeah. a, a thought process? I mean, absolutely. And and you know, like Austin said, there's a place for all that stuff. I mean, that's the sure. great thing about craft beer is is you know, craft beer was influenced by every other beer culture in the world, and now in turn we are influencing every other beer culture. And so you have a lot of innovation, you have a lot of new things, which I think is is just great. Uh, again, like I said, it's a great time to be a beer drinker mm-hmm. because there's something new all the time, and um, you know, I had the opportunity, a good friend of mine is a quality projects director for Fuller's over in London, and my little sister lives over there. And uh, I've gotten gotten to uh, go visit him a couple of times, but he invited me. The first time we went, 
to the uh, uh, London Brewers Alliance meeting. And this was like right pre well, Olympics cool. over there, which was really I cool. I was at the Olympics that's over there. Cool. Oh, were you? Yeah. It yeah. was really cool because you got to kind of hear the discussion of like, okay, these are, we had the the conversation with the, with the, the, the council and, you know, this is what we're going to have to do with uh, logistics for during this time. So it was kind of an interesting yeah, side of things. Really cool. But what was really cool was you saw, you were in a room, you were at Fuller's, which A, is one of Drink just, Porter. just yeah. great traditional yeah. Man. Uh, breweries. Um, and then you had all these craft brewers, uh, you know, English craft brewers. So you had guys that were doing traditional English cask style ales uh, from the craft perspective, but then also, you know, people that were doing double IPAs and mm. Imperial Stouts and all this stuff, which were obviously very influenced by, by the U S craft culture. So it was a very kind of full circle moment, having studied and apprenticed over in Germany, having traveled extensively and just fallen in love with all this traditional stuff to see uh, how, how the craft culture now is influencing those traditions. Right. And so, you know, again, kind of being drawn to this from the cultural perspective, I love the tradition aspect of it. I love, you know, that, that, you know, these beers mean something to this community that these styles have been brewed for so long. And there's a reason that they've been brewed mm-hmm. for so long, because if they're done right, they're pretty fucking good. Yes, they are. Excuse my language. Yeah, you're good. Um, but you but, can get a lot of but, flavors out of yeah, four ingredients. Exactly. And so I, I'm a sucker. I love tradition. I love like if you, if you come over to the brewery right now, they just put uh, big Jamoke on cask, which is probably my favorite beer that ends up Go have to go the, have it on. Yeah, you'll be back. That ends up <laughs> that ends up going through the tap room. room. Yeah, yeah. In, yeah. in fact, yeah. uh, Jake from Heirloom texted. I think Cody the other day was like, "Hey man, when's Big Jamoke coming out on cask?" And so he texted him last night when we decided, okay, we're going to throw it on. Jake was like, uh, "We're going to bring oh, everybody you. over." Is <laughs> cask different than you have one tap that's a sideways tap? That's not yeah. cask, right? No, no, no. So, so it's what's different. the difference in that? So those uh, those those side pull. I don't completely understand okay. that. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to tell myself, but the side pole just, it, it just pours differently and gives more of that like uh creamier, uh, the head, head, right? Yeah. Uh, which a lot of people, you know, American beer, a lot of people are like, I don't want any head on my beer, but, but when it's poured, right? Like, I mean, that stuff's like candy. Right. It's well, so it's like good. the slow pour pills at beer. Exactly. Denver, so it's, it's the yeah, same. Yeah. That's the same style faucet. Okay. Essentially. Yeah. okay. I can maybe explain a little bit. Of yeah, that. I do please. So when you're on that side, uh, side handled, pour system it's a it's a ball valve that's allowing just enough liquid out at a pace to where there's enough agitation that it's decarbonating the beer as it's going into the glass oh wow okay that's why it's a slow pour that's also why it has that real creamy yeah Hashtag awesome. science. Yeah, right. Yep. But cask is also slower so, pour and creamy. So, so cask yep. is a little different in yeah. the sense that, uh, you know, it's often referred to as pulling a pint. So mm. so really the way that those those like diaphragm pumps essentially work is you're you're displacing, you're you're essentially pumping air traditionally, uh, but but you know, in order to keep the keg fresher longer. Um, we have what's called a cask breather, which pushes a very small amount of CO2 mm. in instead of air to basically push that out. And so those beers typically are, there's little to, to there's, there's little carbonation to it. So it essentially, and it's warmer. So it essentially brings a lot of the softer characteristics of the beer. Gotcha. It's a very traditional sort of form of, of, of delivery of, yeah. of the pint. And so um, it gives that creaminess. You get a little bit of that aeration because there's a there's a little head on the end of it called a sparkler that kind of just pushes mm. uh, pushes out of like a it's like a sprinkler so it pushes right, out right, all right. these different heads so that's where you're getting a lot of that aeration and creaminess um, and it's just a, it's just a different way to yeah. to enjoy the beer um, it, you know it's a great it's a great example to be like here's a big jamoke on tap and here's a big jamoke yeah. on cask I so literally am going to leave here and go try very, that on cask. Very different, yeah. but it's probably one of my favorite. And it's one that's, it, it'll, it'll, it'll get you. It'll oh, get yeah. you if you're not you. careful. Yeah. I remember the first time we did it, we, it was when McNelly's was still doing cask in the sidebar. Um, the first time we ever put that on, because that beer is almost 7%. And cask Ooh. being that lower carbonation goes down so smooth. Mm. And I remember I had three of them like real quick, like within 30 <laughs> minutes. And <clears throat> I remember I looked at Wes Ruh-roh. and I was like, um, 
So you have the the company credit card, <laughs> like you're going to tab out because if I don't go home mm-hmm. right now, it's going to hit me and uh, my <laughs> wife's going to be pissed that she's got to come pick me up. This was pre Uber. Right. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, but, but I don't even know how we got on to talking about no, this. I, that I was a traditional it. side of yeah. it. That's what it is. Let yeah. me follow up with, uh, <clears throat> I just want to know both of you. Sure. Did you see, was there ever something that you saw from an adjunct side that was put into a beer that was that moment where it jumped the shark for you? Was there one thing where it was like, you really just put a potato <laughs> in a beer? I mean, like whatever it is, right? Was um, the, can, like, can, I, can I just start? Or? Can I just start a multiple choice yes, checklist? <laughs> Absolutely. Here? Yeah. I mean, I God, I remember a couple of years ago, and I and I love the Stone Cloud guys. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. There was a picture of them like putting handfuls of like German chocolate cake into a thing, and I was just like. That's wrong. Oh, man, this is crazy. I didn't have the beer. I heard it was phenomenal, and I'm sure it was because yeah. everything they do they is, do really is great. Yeah. But I just remember seeing that, and from the, the German Reinheitsgebot purity in me was just like, oh, my God, I, don't, I, I can't watch this. But, again, you know, knowing those guys, I know it was, it was, it was great. And then, you know, it's funny to listen to Matt Denham talk because yeah. he just comes down there and he's just like a little kid. He was like, man, I just do crazy shit. I put crazy <laughs> shit in beer. It's like, you know what I did? And I'm like, yeah, and I don't get it, but hey, more power to you. Yeah. Go like, for it. Like, you know, yeah. some of the stuff like really hits and some of it doesn't for me. But, but, uh, but, you know, again, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's creating this culture and creating uh, excitement. And, you know, the great thing is, is, the more that, uh, you know, we have our, our people, you have your people within our block. I mean, you get a lot of people on Saturday, Fridays and Saturdays, like people hop around mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, we're all doing something a little I'll bit always different. Always make the loop. Yeah, yeah we're yeah. all doing something mm-hmm. a little bit different. And the more that uh, people are doing things that, that draw people to the area and to craft beer in general, the better. But yeah, I've always mm-hmm. like, I love tradition. I love the traditional aspect of it. Um, I love, I mean, we, we started making the folks bills like, oh, so we started the brewery. We, we made, we first, we made McNally's pub ale and sundown wheat. And then about three weeks later, I think is when we brought Atlas in, uh, that would have been in April, May, June. That's still and then in, great. And then in September, um, we did, uh, we brought folks bills and that was always the thing of like, you know, this is a style near and dear to my heart. I'm. I miss drinking fresh German Pilsners. Like I want this. So I'm brewing this more for myself than anything else. Great in fact, the first keg of that was my, my bachelor party because like Heck. a dumbass, I got married. I had started a business, bought a house and got married in the span of like three months. Jeez. What else could you check off? The right. List? No, no, no kid. kids. If yeah, I'd had a kids, kid. I probably wouldn't yeah. be here. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, but so I remember it's like, okay, yeah. Like, this has to be ready for this. So the first, the first keg of that was, uh, was, uh, was for the bachelor party. Mm. And, uh, you know, we've made it, made it ever since. And, and I always like to joke that we made Pilsners before they were cool because now bloggers and Pilsners and all that's having a Renaissance, which is great. And thank the Lord. And it's funny because like, you know, one of the guys made the comment earlier that like just in the last year, like Volks is really, it's always had it's kind of like cult mm-hmm. following. We've always had places that have done really well with it, but it's not the beer that people are like, yeah, we're going to put your Pilsner on. Right. Um, it's always made it, it's made enough to make sense, like to keep making it. Um, but over the last year, it's definitely increased considerably. And, uh, and one of the guys made the comment and we've seen a lot more go to Oklahoma city. And one of the guys made the comment that it's like, it's Matt, Matt Denham goes over and tells all those, those stone cloud guys that, uh, they need to be drinking Volks pills and, and, uh, and which is great. I mean, that yeah. at the end of the day, it's like, uh, you know, we're going to move that beer to a can at some point. We're kind of uh, slowly shifting. Awesome. I'm ready for that towards cans yeah. just because, you know, as we've done, as we've, as we've shifted stuff, I mean, it's just starting to financially, it doesn't make yeah. sense to the bottom. I mean, this is, this I can't the, wait to this, try that one. I haven't tried the, that yet. This, this is year. the last of yeah. Big Jamoke bottles because oh, really? it's moving to a moving can to as well. And so, um, is that because of the glass? I heard and not to. It has nothing to do with glass <laughs> shortage. Okay. It, it literally okay. has to do with like, you know, because we're bottling less, um, we're having to buy less. Um, yeah. You know, buy less glass, so it's becoming a little bit more expensive. 
But then also really it becomes, you know, paper products have gone up so much. Mm -hmm. And so since we're not buying, you know, 20 to 40,000 six packs at a time, our price is almost tripled on six packs. Mm -hmm. So it just starts to get to the economic standpoint of like, it doesn't make sense because right now we're bottling Atlas, Big Jamoke, and Volks. And so now Oktoberfest's cans now? Yeah, Oktoberfest's okay. cans now. Yeah. Um so uh so yeah, I mean part of that it's like you know, there'll be some things I think that will keep bottling. Um you know, and I'm hesitant to get rid of the bottling line because last year everybody ran into this crunch of Can like, shortage. "Oh shit, yep. what are we going to do about yeah. cans?" and we were always kind of like, "Well, we don't want to do this, but if we have to, yeah. Uh, we're in a position where we can we can uh, we can move to uh, to bottles if if so, and you know it also may open a new opportunity. We may decide that I'm just spitballing here. We haven't talked about this, but we may decide. Okay, well, what if we make a ginger beer, or yeah. what if we bottle a root beer, or something like that? You That'd know, it cool. gives us gives us the opportunity there. But um, you know, cans just become. I mean, as you know, it's it's as we've moved into more of the the convenience and grocery and and uh you know space becomes limited and and everything there they've all moved to to more cans just because they can fit more yep. cans in a, in a set than they can bottles right so you yep. have to answer the adjunct question and oh then, okay. and then tell us yeah, about yeah, sure. this beer yeah tell us about this beer too. uh yeah 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 so you know one i i do i'm i like experimenting with adjuncts uh, on a very, very small scale. We have our Brubaca series. Like we just released our, uh, peanut butter stout. Oh, is that the 14% beer? No, it's, it's 18%. 18. Sorry. Let me me say this too. I will say as as much as I said that, like early on when, when we, when we were doing the, the Firkins back in the day, back before a lot of people were going, yeah, you put some some weird shit. One of of the better ones I think was Jamoke with uh, York peppermint patties, (laughs) which I think that was the, no, here. Okay. Did you put Skittles in one? let Let me go back. Let me go back. You know, all respect again to stone cloud on the cake thing. I think the one that probably the first one that probably hurt me was when I saw guys putting a bunch of Sour Patch Kids and a Sundown Wheat in a firkin, and, uh, and 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 that was just like, God damn it, where like where are we? <laughs> where are we in society? And, all this? and uh, little did I know that we keep going on, and then 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 you've got, uh, uh, you know, again, all due respect, you got Travis. Travis Richards putting fucking muffins in a beer and, uh, and, and at the end of the day, they're good beers. Yeah. You know, oh, I remember one of the guys coming to me too was saying like, uh, like, Oh man, we're going to go down. Uh, you know, they're having a, they're having a, a, you know, a watermelon thing where they've got their soft serve beer. And what I was like, wait, soft serve beer. And, and Cody was like, Oh, it's like the best soft serve ice cream in town. And I went down there and he ain't lying. That shit was good. Yeah. And, uh, but it was just like, <laughs> man, this is so, so crazy. And so I, obviously yeah. I, I'm going to preface uh, again, I say that not out of disrespect. Right. It's just so different than, you know, where my mind has always been on the yeah. fish. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, 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 <laughs> no. Uh, 18% I, peanut butter. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. We, uh, uh, I will say I'm in very in the same mind when, when I get the most giddy and the most excited mm-hmm. when like, I get to make, you know, an anniversary ale that's a golden strong, 12% four ingredients. Oh, you left that off earlier. 12%? It's 12%. Okay. So your your cheeks might be a little rosy. <laughs> right. Um, you know, it it allows me to really It's gonna be the best PT meeting <laughs> I think hey, I've had this year. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh so you know, uh, this is one malt, one hop. Uh I'm I'm not calling it a smash beer just because I don't think that it's worth mentioning, but it is one hot, one, one malt. And I got to experiment with a new yeast strain this year that I've always wanted to experiment with in a golden strong. Uh, and that's when I get the most giddy Mm. and really when, you know, my wheels start turning because it, you get sciencey with it. You, you, you nerd out on making this beer in beer sense, but also at the same time, the exact same week, I'm throwing 20 pounds of Reese's peanut butter cups <laughs> into a 18% stout, and it just kind of makes 
one, it just makes me giggle, but two, also my stomach churn yep, and, yep. you know, right it's like, man, It's like, man, I love both of those <laughs> things, but the fact that they're going in yeah. together, like, kind of hurts, but then it's like, have you seen something in a beer that prompted you to be like, what the fuck? Like, seriously? Uh, uh, fried chicken in that, a mash. Wait, oh, is that uh, Thomas in Jefferson's New York, chicken? Th- oh, no. <laughs> no. I've had a beer in Golden, Colorado at I wish I could remember the name of the brewery off the top. Of, it wasn't that. Uh, that I'll have to think Golden about it. Or that yeah, and, it was. Uh, I, I never got to have the beers, but fried chicken and mash. I that that is just stupid. I, I think the FDA actually stepped in and, and I tried that the beer. They you called did? it Thomas Jefferson's chicken in a beer at the brewery. Golly, that's gross. And I asked him about it. I was like, "What is going on?" They're like, "Well, this we found an old recipe back from when there was not electricity, and so when they would brew beer." They would also cook dinner, and they would cook uh, the okay. chicken well, I guess in the beer, sense. and then eat the chicken. Oh sure. man, I got a I got a crazy story. This this podcast is going to end up being three parts because I'm just going to talk. Good. Keep right? going. Yeah. So we had when I, I was at drink that when I was at Victory. Yep. Yeah. Whenever when I was at Victory. Yes. When I was at Victory, brought it with me this time. We there had so one of my best friends uh, to this day still. Like we started at Victory right at the same time, and he was the. Uh, the QA QC director and just a super brilliant guy. Like he came from the, he had a, he had a PhD in biochem from Duke and, and, you know, worked in the science, the drug research, cancer, early cancer research stuff for a long time. And then just was like, man, I, I gotta, I gotta work in beer. I love this. Well, somehow he had connected, um, through this, uh, through the American society of brewing chemists with this old, old guy who, um, used to work for uh schmitz so long you know one of those old like Falstaff, mm-hmm. you know one of the one of those old brands um that was in uh in pennsylvania and so he had brought through a bunch of his old buddies that um that uh were worked together at schmitz that were all in the qaqc side of things and and gave them a tour and we ended up hanging out drinking some beers and one of the guy told the story uh, about how they went to um to basically tour this brewery that they were going to purchase. And you talked about the fried chicken and that made me think of this uh, or, or, or cooking while they were right. brewing right. was that uh, this guy told the story about how he was uh, touring and they were brewing and the guy was, uh, there was this giant chain hanging down in the, in the kettle. And the guy was like, well, what is, what's the, I've, you know, I've, done been in a lot of breweries i've toured a bunch of like i've never seen a chain like that what's the purpose of that and he was like oh let me show you he reaches in and he pulls this thing up and there's a fucking turkey at the end shut of the up thing. The guy was cooking a turkey in the boil of the uh of the the beer and it was just like holy shit was that like, a thanksgiving if, beer yeah right oh, exactly so. it was yeah. like Man, if you if if the people knew, so no oh. wonder why you're trying to sell this brewery because you're going bankrupt because right. uh, you're you're essentially cooking turkeys. In right. I will say that chicken in a beer that I had, it had so the way they made it at the brewery in Golden. What did you ask me if it was? It, it might have been Golden City Brew. Golden. Yeah. No, it wasn't that. I think it was Golden City Brewing Company or something like that. It had. They didn't actually cook a chicken in the beer. They just put okay. like, I don't know how they did it when they recreated it, but it had the mouthfeel, a more visceral, like fatty mouthfeel, if that makes sense. Like oh, you were almost drinking sure. stock, like the, Oh, that makes my heart hurt. We did. Yeah. We, we actually did a beer with bacon. We did a Rauch beer with bacon. Did one you really? Time yeah. For, um, there's a, there's a famous beer author, Stephen Reichland, mm-hmm. um, who was coming through. So when this land press was, was, producing weekly they had this series they were trying to do a podcast series called what the fork and uh he was coming through on something i think with the uh the food bank and so they were like hey you know this what the fork is like we go into a a kitchen well now we want to do a reverse thing where we bring a chef like to you guys and we're thinking with him coming in like what if we did a beer and i was like well what if we did a you know, a rock beer. Like, what if we did a barbecue? What beer? kind of beer Rauk is that? Beer. Rauk beer, that's Rauk beer a is a smoked beer. lager. A smoked basically. lager. Uh, and and so uh, so we put like a pound of bacon in in uh, in uh, in the beer, and it was interesting. Like, you know, at the end of the day, with a with a smoked beer, you're not really gonna 
taste, but but you could kind of see that like salty counter right. point. So for those listening, that I'm don't proud understand. Of yeah, it was wild. <laughs> is it raw bacon? Is it cooked bacon? Like I th- at what I th- point? I think we cooked. I think okay. we cooked it. Yeah, we didn't. Yeah. Because that was kind of one kinda of those gross. things like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. what do we Yeah, no, no. Do? So we, we, we cooked here? it and then yeah. threw it in there. Yeah. But, you know, all that grease kills the head of a beer. So it had yeah. no oh, head. Yeah, yeah. But, but it was it was it was interesting. As we drink this, tell us about Big Jamoke. And then you have a question. I've yep. been hogging the mic. No, 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 no. So yeah. you're good. You're so good. Big Jamoke's our winter seasonal. It's a it's a robust porter. Um, It's, you know, just the classic traditional, again, kind of getting back to that traditional style. Yeah. It's it's almost seven percent. It's got that very definitely needs to be consumed a little bit warmer, uh, but it's definitely got a very like decadent sort of dark chocolate characteristic to it as yeah. you go through. But just, I can't wait uh, to have that on cask later. D- is one, there of, a, one of my one of my favorites? Is there a story? Sorry, sorry. there is a story. Okay, so getting into that. Yeah. So, so you know, naming beers is is. Honestly, and it's gotten worse as we've gone along because when we started, there were about 1,500 breweries. Now there's close to 10,000. Is it like naming horses where there can't be duplicate names of beers? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, for yeah, the most yeah, part. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, we're trying to go through, trying to name this beer. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we originally launched this beer. It was in a 22-ounce bottle, which are commonly referred to as bombers. So mm-hmm. one day it just kind of hit me of this old picture that I had of my grandfather from world war ii he was a he was a b-25 he was a b-25 pilot uh and one of the the plane that he was sitting in at that point was uh was big jamoke it was called big jamoke and so that's so so cool i just remember that picture and i i was like okay this is what we're doing and uh wes was totally on board and everybody else and so this is still one of my favorites anytime we bottle it it's like you get this he passed away when I was uh, my first day of fifth grade. So he passed mm-hmm. away in like 1992. Still one of the greatest people I've ever met in my life. And I, what so I would cool, give man. to have an adult conversation with him. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, but every year we brew this for the first time and you kind of see this traveling down the line. And my That's grandpa's so smiling cool. at me. It's it's it really is a is a great thing. So, is so that, it just kind of worked. And so so is it a character of him? It is. Yeah. Okay. So um, that basically is based on the picture uh, of him sitting there. That is there. so cool. And, uh, and, and yeah, and so he, uh, he, he was just an awesome guy, but um, my dad had done some research, and then a guy who really loved this beer uh, had sent me something similar, but it was basically a um, kind of a, a log of that bomb wing of, like, all the, the missions that, mm-hmm. that they flew and so you can go back and find the planes that he flew God, and whatever. And so he flew big jumps yeah, several times. Cool. And I think that's the one that he actually flew home. That is so cool. But uh, we did a couple of years ago, we did a couple of different variants of, of big Jamoke mm-hmm. and we used the, uh, we used the names of some of the other planes that he flew. Like, uh, I remember like that. we did a, we did a, uh, 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 like a stronger, like we pulled off the first runnings of that and boiled it down. So it was more like, nine and a half percent mm. i think that was called um double i don't I can't remember double oh nine or something like that and then paper doll was another one so we named them after all oh, the things which was really that's cool, so that's cool. So, and, and the neat thing was is, is because of this i've gotten um i i got i got a call from somebody up in uh, wisconsin that was like my dad was was uh he was a, a bombardier on on the big jamoke uh, he was on that at one point. That's so cool. Like, I don't think they crossed paths, but they right. were like, please, like, can we buy some right. merchandise or whatever? But kind of to, to be able to to tell those stories and have those conversations right. is is really cool. Um, and, uh, you know, again, probably one of the greatest people I've ever met in my life. And and to be able to kind of honor honor him and yeah. and have a great beer, uh, you know, it, it just uh, it's one of my favorites. And, and it's it's. You know, with every seasonal, you probably get this too. You always have people. Why don't you make that year round? Well, because people don't want to drink a seven percent porter. That's what I was talking about. It's one hundred and five degrees yeah. in August, and we're but, sweating uh, all the time. Yeah, but between this one and El Kakui, which were your last two releases, yep. are probably no offense to your other beers, which are all good. My two favorites. Yeah, like well, the Black Kikui- IPA. El Kakui is yeah. one of those that like. Um, so I was at uh, Great American Beer Fest early on, and Mitch Steele, who was the head brewer at uh, Stone at that point, he now has a brewery in, in Atlanta called New Realm, 
Uh, Mitch was up there talking about innovation. I mean, we're talking early innovation, not not throwing right. You hey, know, it's st- not it, throwing chocolate cake and muffins <laughs> and sour patch kids. It and was beer. still good innovation. Um, he's talking about uh, innovation and and the whole black IPA, and I was like, what is that? And so after listening to this, what this, is it? This what makes it black? Thing, um, I, I go and I find the beer that they made, which yeah. was one of their anniversary beers that ended up becoming uh, a beer called Sublimely Self Righteous Ale. And I was like, holy shit, I love this beer. And so I literally, in terms of, of like R and D, like it was probably the beer that I've spent the most time, most iterations on. I think we probably brewed nine different batches of that beer before mm. I was like, all right, that's it. Mm. And every year we do it, we change the dry hop a little bit uh, and so on. But uh, so I, I, I'm super proud of that beer. I love that beer. Um, but Black IPA, basically, the, to me, it's like the, the challenge is, is it's not a hoppy stout. Right. You know, it's you get the color and you get a very faint characteristic of those dark malts without it being roasty or overwhelming. Like it's got to be a fine a line. Stout. Yeah. So, you know, get chalky quick. Yeah, they can get chalky. Exactly. And so, you know, it comes with, you know, what we figured out is using a little bit of um, Weiermann, which is the the German malting company that we use primarily. They make a dehusked malt called uh, Carafa Special, which dehusk basically takes away the bitterness to it. And Mm -hmm. so we use a little bit of that, but we don't use it in the mashing process. We use it after, like after it moves over into the runoff side of things. So you're really picking up the color and just a very, again, that very faint hint of, uh, of those, uh, those, those dark flavors mm-hmm. without it being overwhelmingly roasty or, or whatever. So I, I love that beer and yeah. I look forward to it coming out last year. Last year when we did it, I think I, I did Tom Gilbert's beer of the week. And so I was like, Hey, this is coming out. So we're going to do this. I literally had one and then it was gone. Yeah. And I did not have, I had one El Kukui last year. And so when it came oh, out my this word. year, I was like, give me <laughs> yeah. taking this whole thing. And right. so we had uh, trick or treating is a big deal in my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And so we had a, uh, we had, we drank, a, we drank a little bit of that. Uh, well, on, I was going to say, you can't be handing also. out El Kukui. That's, on, uh, I will say that's the only black IPA that I drink anymore. Well, thank you. You're very that. welcome. I appreciate <laughs> it. It's awesome. Thinking about the future of of what Tulsa and our community within the craft beer industry is, uh, I'm curious in your perspective, where do you think our industry in the craft beer is going to move towards within Oklahoma? Ooh. He's asking the whale hard, hard hitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, it's like... Slide towards us a little it, bit it, to make sure you're in the it's, it's hard too room. because it's like uh you know the way that the, you know when we started if you would have told me hey 13 years from now there's going to be almost 10,000 brews I've been like fuck out of here you're, <laughs> yeah, you're <right>. crazy <laughs> and we have it, what, you know 20% and, and, of the market it, now yeah i know and and now it's like you know and again now we've got these crazy uh you know adjunct beers or whatever and so you know, at this point, it's like I, I'm done trying to guess what's going to happen. Yeah. But, you know, I think that uh, I, I think we've probably hit a point where I don't I don't think you're going to see a massive number of breweries open again. I mean, I think I think maybe we'll see some go away and maybe you'll see a couple more added to the to the mix. But I think we're probably at that like healthy level um, now of 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 breweries. Um, but you know what what happens moving forward uh I, I don't know i mean i think that we've all kind of um we've all we all kind of have our thing and everybody's doing things a little bit differently which i think is cool um again that that adds to the whole culture of everything um what what does the evolution look like i don't know i mean you know we're 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 in a world where Fucking seltzers are like, yeah. you know, which you haven't done a thing, right? which I haven't yeah. done, which we, you know, probably won't do. Yeah. N- neither um, will we. You know, they're, they're definitely, you know, you start thinking about some, some different ideas of like, okay, how do we cater to that side of things without going there? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there's certainly some of those, uh, 
conversations. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think the, the great thing is, is that, you know, I always like to talk about how, like, you know, when I was started, like when I was, uh, I had an older brother who was, you know, definitely an older brother and a dad who, you know, were, were, were definitely venturing out, trying different things. I remember, you know, my dad's, uh, my dad plays bagpipes and he's big into the whole Scottish heritage thing. And so I remember always being out at the, the Scottish games and dad always had uh, Newcastle brown ale and McEwen's IPA, which you can't even get here anymore. Mm. I haven't told you the last time I had a Nuki Brown either. That's been a long yeah, time, right? but two great beers, yeah, you know, right. great traditional beers, but you know, again, so far out of the realm. And then I started working uh, in college. My college job was uh, was at Ranch Acres Wine and Spirits when I turned twenty one. Love Stewart Mary, family. Yep. Love Mary and all those people. Yep. And to this day, it's still like one of my favorite places. And Mary's one of my favorite people uh, there is. Truman the dog. Truman the dog. Truman wasn't there <laughs> no, when I was there. Um, yeah. Emily, who's uh, yep. who's Truman's doggy mommy, yep. right? Yep. Is that doggy mommy? Doggy mommy. Uh, that works. <laughs> yeah, that, that works. Sure. I like it. I'm pointing it. Uh, she was in high school at that point. Okay. It's starting to show some age here. But, um, but uh, um, you know, it was a great college job, and it kind of exposed me. I started drinking a little bit more of the the craft beer stuff and, and, you know, a couple of the older guys in the fraternity were like, Ooh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try, I'll try one of those out of the six pack. And then by the time I was a senior, I had a couple of my buddies into it. And that's kind of where that, uh, that, that crazy, uh, um, Bigfoot story <laughs> comes in, yeah, but we yeah. won't go in there. Um, <clears throat> maybe, maybe I'll tell you the guys off. Air. There you go. Know. There you go. Um, but you know, you get to the senior year where you got a couple of those guys, but then there was a couple of the freshmen coming in who were interested in home brewing and really interested in a lot of these different beers. So you just started to kind of see this change of people, you know, from what's the cheapest thing I can drink to like, hey, there's actually cool shit to drink out there. And mm-hmm. again, at the same time, McNally's was starting. So you start to see just this cultural shift of things. Uh, and, and now, you know, craft beer, which was very much like a, a niche thing is more, I hate to use the term mainstream, but it's definitely more, um, normal than it was at that point. So you're just seeing the evolution of that become, uh, more towards this sort of European tradition of like the breweries are part of the community and that's what the people drink because the people support, which I think is, is great. That's not to say that, you know, macro breweries don't have a place and, and right. aren't being consumed and you know there's there's a time and place for everything right um so you know i think as we continue to go along i would like to see that uh, that the breweries continue to 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 build on that um i think we have an opportunity as an industry and as a as a group to collectively do more good in the community and that's ultimately the thing that i want uh, i think i've told you about this and i think i've talked to others i want to I want to get to a point where, um, you know, I've had this whole idea of like a, like a day of service type of thing, whether we do it quarterly or whatever and rotate it around the breweries to where it's like, Hey, we all get together. We pick one thing. Maybe we pick one thing and see it through to the end and then move on to something different. But like, you know, we host, you know, whoever's the the host that quarter, like we go out and do our thing and come back and drink at that brewery. We, right? we kind of mm. did that right before COVID, right? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. It, and, we and went up and cleaned the streets with yeah, you guys. Right. And exactly. That was really cool. And so, you know, I'd like to see more of that type of stuff happen. And I think as we're, you know, as we're, we're getting more kind of, you know, vaccination stuff, we're kind of getting to a point where people are starting to feel a little more comfortable. I think maybe we have the leeway to start yeah. doing this stuff, but I, I feel like, you know, we've, we've hit a point where, you know, people understand, okay, man, these, these, these breweries, they're here to stay. This is part of our community. And now I think we have the opportunity to really use that as a vehicle to do some, some more positive stuff, which is, which is great. So I want to see that continue, which, which hopefully then will just, you know, make that side of things, again, make that pie yeah. grow a little bit larger. So I, uh, you know, again, I think this is, it, it's, I love, like I said, I love the crafted for community. I love that sort of idea and the foundation of those things. And I think that we're fortunate that most of the breweries here in town kind of feel that way and, and, and yeah. tend mm-hmm. towards that. And I think that collectively we have such a wide reach 
that uh, that we can really do a lot of cool shit in this town. Yeah, you know, that, and and I think moving forward, the more that we can kind of leverage that and do that together, a it strengthens that sort of camaraderie between the breweries, but b it it also just you know lets the city realize that hey, like okay, you know Tulsa was an oil town. And then when a lot of that left, there was a lot of money that, that was still here mm-hmm. that helped small business kind of become a thing. And so obviously breweries here are small business and that's part of the essence of this town. We've got a lot of great music history here too, which is also part of that essence. And as that thing, as that side of thing continues to grow, you know, if we're all lockstep, man, we can make this place a yeah. fucking cool place, you know, yeah. not that it isn't already, yeah. I but think, you know, I think that we, in the in the long term, my goal yeah. is that you know we've we've had a lot of brain drain in this town, and I think Elliot referenced that mm-hmm. you know our our you know the export of of bright minds from this is still a, a yeah. what plagues the city. I think it's gotten a lot better. I mean, I think that you know when I when I again kind of going back to college, I look at all my close buddies from college that you know went to New York or Denver or Dallas yeah. or wherever. Uh, you know, as time has gone along, I think people have said, no, 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 Tulsa is pretty cool. I'm going to stay here. But my, my goal in life is to develop, develop this place to a point where my kids don't want to leave because mm. I don't, I don't want to, my, my little sister lives in London yeah, right yeah. now and that's hard right. enough. And I don't yep. want to, I can't imagine not living in the same town as my kids. And so I want my kids to have the opportunity to realize whatever they want to do in life, yeah. that they can do it right here because this really is a great city. And one of my favorite things uh, about Tulsa is when you talk to people who are like, man, I, I went to Tulsa once on business and am I, I ended up bringing my family back because it was such a cool town. Yeah. And it really is. I mean, that was the, the thing when I lived on the East Coast, like people were like, oh, t- Tulsa? What, like Oklahoma? Like why, yeah. why are you right. trying to go back there? You're still living like, in Because TVs? the place is awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, yeah. I, I, th- I think moving forward, that's where I want it. That's what I want it to be. And I want it, mm-hmm. want it to go. In. I think and that's I, a good place to, to end it. Right. I mean, that's sure. That's golden. Cause I but, go ahead. You know, what yeah. And I, I mean, I can, I can back you up on, you know, you've lived in Germany. You've traveled through all sorts of other cultures and, uh, from my own history and what I've also gone through, I've lived lived in Germany, lived in a few different continents actually, but I always come back to Tulsa because of what this town has to offer. And there, I think we've developed a really great and rich culture here that is going to be able to keep people here, your kids here, uh, my kids here that don't exist yet. Uh, but, uh, because I don't even think that we're even close to what, Ooh, what, good what catch. our, what our, uh, that was almost potential a is. catastrophe that at, it was almost a catastrophe. At the end of the day, catch. I mean, to sum that all up at the end of the day, it's about the people. And, you yeah. know, in the last year, you know, politics and you know view on covid and all of that stuff is has saw has caused so much contention and so many you know so much anxiety yeah, and all yeah. that at the end of the day like people here are able to to get past that and when it comes to the interaction with each other like there's just genuinely good people here mm-hmm. and i think when you have that that's the greatest thing that we have to offer not not only in this town but in the state total that like you know, if we can continue to build on that and build these relationships and build this community where we have the ability to, you know, just be kind to each other and to yeah. support each other, uh, you know, I think we continue to grow and build on that. Now, in saying all that, you know, people are always like, oh, you know, Tulsa's the next Austin or whatever. I don't want that shit. You know, no, it's no. like people always like, I don't, I don't want the traffic. I don't want the madness there. Right. Now, now, do we need to have some infill and grow a little bit more to support, you know, a lot of the great business? Yes, absolutely. But, and I think there's some, some things that, that, you know, not to use the term exploit, there's some things that we ex- exploit. 
there's not there's 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 things that we can continue to 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 grow on and do better there that will make uh the 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 city better and and shine more but at the end of the day it is it's the people and it's the goodness mm-hmm. it's the quality it's the relationships that we all have and i think that that that's that's uh things that are are not uh, present in in yep. a lot of other cities, just because of the the the, the pace, right. the mentality of everything. But it it's always been, um, it's always been here in Oklahoma and key. And I think that that we can continue to grow on that. And and you know, not to be all rah rah, but you know, but right. love each other yeah. and support each other. And 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 I think that's what's great about Tulsa and in, in Oklahoma. Yeah. And I'll say this as we let you go. Ninety plus minutes later, you know the the point of this podcast is to to kind of delve into and, and figure out how not only the beer industry and the brewery industry, but food and nightlife and culture and all that can, can help put Tulsa on the map and elevate Tulsa from a national perspective. And you singularly did that for the craft beer industry in being what you talked about, the trailblazing and, and what you had to do and what you had to go through in order to help create the culture that now exists. So cheers to you. Eric Marshall. Yeah, man, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Making the hair but on it's my the neck truth. stand up. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers to you. you thanks for coming thanks, on. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and, absolutely. And love the conversation and the beers and yeah. look forward to more, whether it's on, on the mic or yeah, absolutely. not. Absolutely. That's right. Cheers, yep. guys. We'll be right back after the break. Cheers. And that is Eric Marshall, the godfather. Yeah, he didn't have, great, a, pi- great, he didn't have a pinky ring or anything. He did not, but great conversation. <laughs> great conversation. Like, uh, and this man, beer, man, big Jamal. Golly, I always go back to it. It's so fucking it's good. So good. Huh. <laughs> mm. I literally uh, might wrap this up and then go have it on cast. Go for it. Yeah, I, I think so. unfortunately have an event, so I'm going to miss that. And well, I, shit. I am sad yep. in my heart. Uh, in my heart. <laughs> in my heart. <laughs> but uh, that that was such a great conversation. Yeah, it was such. Uh, Heartfelt answers from him. Is this from your beer spill? It is from my yeah, beer spill. Yeah, it is. So, yeah. But you caught it. It was great. Impressively Impressive. caught it. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. Um, I, if we were going to sum up, you know, Eric's conversation in one word, I think it would be community. It would be community. I think it would be community. Like, he's just such a champion for not only you and Cabin Boys, but for the entire craft beer industry, especially in Oklahoma and especially in Tulsa. Yeah. His, his history with me, um, I just want to say he alone has really shaped me as a brewer mm. and as a business owner uh, because of the manner and the way that he was able to uh, influence my decisions and uh, really encouraged me within owning my business, starting the business. And uh, not only when we weren't started, uh, as a business and open, you know, I, I, I go back to my, my moment of crisis, uh, mm-hmm. which is one of the darkest moments of my life. And maybe we'll touch on that later, but, uh, he helped me out in such a intense and, uh, his hospitality and community driven mindset, mm-hmm. you know, being able to in actually invest his time into my business yeah in a way that kept my business going when i couldn't that that that's really it, it's huge it's yeah. huge for me and i i yeah. hold that memory really dear to Absolutely. my heart and he's he's someone that you know has a lot of clout and a lot of uh a uh, heart within what he does. Yeah, absolutely. So, and you know, you guys touched on that a little bit, but you brought the whale questions. Good job. Thank the, you very the big, much. The big yeah. questions. I, I brought the big questions. Yeah, you really did. <laughs> uh, it was fun. Uh, we're not going to tell you who's next. Uh, it'll be a surprise. That's right. right? Yeah. It'll be a surprise, but it we're, might, we're having fun. Be, it might be from someone right across the street. It might be, but we're having fun on the tasting room as you can tell by all the, yeah, absolutely. And conversations. Thank you guys for listening. Yeah, absolutely. This has been a lot of fun. We'll see you next week. Cheers. Cheers.